This is a story about Arthur Ashe, one of the greatest tennis players and champions. He lived from 1943 to 1993. During the first half of the 20th century, as modern tennis started, the plight of African Americans who wanted to play tennis and compete was parallel to how African Americans were treated in American society. They were segregated and not allowed to play tennis with white Americans. Tennis was subject to the Jim Crow laws. The Jim Crow laws were upheld by the Supreme Court in the 1896 ruling in Plessy v. Ferguson. This said that the states could not prohibit segregation. Because of the Jim Crow laws and discrimination against African Americans, they could also not participate in United States Lawn Tennis Association tournaments. The African Americans had to create a separate organization for them to play tennis. In 1916, a group of African American tennis professionals who were interested in the sport created the American Tennis Association, which is an organization that enables African Americans to play at various African American clubs throughout the country. Prior to Arthur Ashe, other African Americans struggled to break the tennis barrier in the United States. Through the ATA, many early African American champions were able to emerge in the tennis community. For example, Althea Gibson, who in 1946 was just 19, won junior national titles in 1944 and 1945. Besides Althea Gibson, another major factor were the African-American tennis sisters, Margaret and Matilda Romania Peters, who took tennis by storm in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s, way before the Williams sisters entered the tennis scene. These pioneering efforts by African-American tennis players led the way for Arthur Ashe to break the racial tennis barrier and help integrate American tennis. Arthur Robert Ashe Jr., better known as Arthur Ashe, was born into a working-class family in Richmond, Virginia on July 10, 1943. Ashe had to deal with the tragedy early as his mother died when he was only seven because of a complication resulting from pregnancy. As a result, both Ash and his younger brother, Johnny, were taken care by their dad, Arthur Ash Sr., a disciplinarian who wanted his children to succeed in academics and sports. It happened that the Ashes lived on the grounds of Brookfield Park, Richmond's largest African-American-only playground, which included four tennis courts. Because of the courts' close proximity to the family home, Ash practiced constantly from the age of seven. Over time, Ron Charity, Virginia Union University's tennis coach, began to notice Ash's talent and began to teach him some of the basic strokes and encouraged him to compete in local tournaments. While in high school, Charity brought him to Robert Walter Johnson, an already famous African-American coach who coached players like Althea Gibson. Johnson taught Ash etiquette, which included not arguing with umpires over close calls. Ash would later be celebrated for the respect Johnson taught him years earlier. Later, during Ash's senior year of high school in 1960, he was offered by a tennis coach and good friend of Johnson, Richard Hudlin, to move in and train him in St. Louis. Hudlin changed Ash's game drastically by introducing him to serve and volley a game style which involved rushing to the net after hitting a serve. Players such as Rod Laver and Pancho Gonzalez pioneered the serve and volley game style. The next year, 1961, Ash became the first African-American player to win the U.S. Interscholastic Tournament during the tournament's first year that the tournament was integrated. Because of Ash's barrier-breaking efforts, he was featured in the December 1960 issue of Sports Illustrated. Additionally, he was awarded a tennis scholarship by UCLA College, where he had the honor of practicing with his idol, Pancho Gonzalez. While at UCLA in 1963, Ash became the first black player ever selected for the United States Davis Cup team. In 1968, Ash won the United States Amateur Championships against Davis Cup teammate Bob Lutz, and right after winning the first U.S. Open of the Open Era, becoming the first black male to capture the title and the only player to have won both the amateur and open national championships in the same year. 
Prior to 1968, the four Grand Slams were only open to amateurs. In this very first year of the United States Open, Ash, who was the fifth seed, had not dropped a set in his first three matches. However, his quarterfinal match against South African Cliff Drysdale, who won the United States Championships in 1965 before it was open to professionals, put up a four-set fight. From there, the road to the trophy just got harder. The finals against the 8th seed veteran from the Netherlands, Tom Oker, was a four-hour epic. Because they did not play tie breaks at 6-all, Ash won the first set 14-12. Winning the first U.S. Open that amateurs and professionals could both play made Ash a world celebrity. Arthur used his fame to break other barriers. Despite all the racial barriers, Ash successfully broke in the tennis world. In 1969, he was denied a visa to South Africa because of his race, which meant that he could not play in the South African Open. From the 1940s to the 90s, which was when South Africa was under white rule, a system of institutional segregation of races called apartheid was enforced. Ash kept trying to get a visa and would not get one. Eventually, he used his example of discrimination by the South Africans to lobby for U.S. sanctions to be imposed on South Africa and for the International Law and Tennis Association to ban them from competing. Ash's call for action was heard when the country was disqualified from the 1970 Davis Cup. Later on, in 1974, South Africa granted a visa to Ash in that country's hopes into getting back into the Davis Cup. At this point in his career, the public was able to see the off-court activist side of Ash. In other words, this was really the first time he tried to break racial barriers off the court. Additionally, in 1969, Ash helped found the National Junior Tennis League, a nonprofit organization that teaches poor kids in inner cities the importance of character and education through the sport of tennis. Well, Arthur, uh, along with uh, several other people, they had this idea of trying to create more tennis champions, and they thought they could recruit great black athletes and Hispanic athletes by bringing tennis, you know, making tennis more popular, bringing it to the parks and playgrounds. Ash eventually retired in April of 1980 after undergoing heart surgery in December of 1979 because of a heart attack he experienced while teaching a tennis clinic. After his retirement, he continued to be at the front lines of the civil rights movement. In fact, he was arrested twice for protesting. The first time for protesting outside of a South African embassy during a January 1985 anti-apartheid rally. Later in September of 1992, he was arrested outside of the White House for protesting a government crackdown on Haitian refugees. Despite still being able to advocate, his health was in decline. During a heart surgery, he was given HIV and AIDS tainted blood at the time few were aware of this new and deadly disease. Ash passed away on February 6, 1993 from AIDS-related pneumonia. Arthur's legacy still lives on. Ash is celebrated as the greatest African-American tennis player. Additionally, the various organizations he helped found, such as the NJTL and the Arthur Ashe Foundation for the Defeat of AIDS, still help others today. In 1997, when the Billie Jean King National Tennis Center opened, the main stadium was named in Ash's honor. I think his very, very important part of his fact that he contracted AIDS and the timing of it and the way he worked to make people realize that this was a serious disease for all Americans to cope with, I think that was a very uh, significant part of his legacy. Of course, in civil rights and his work with South Africa, bring attention to the evils of, of apartheid and his working in this country for civil rights for all Americans. I mean, that, that was huge. And you're an amateur, but yet your life is tennis and sometimes do you wish you could stop and get off and look back and see what's happening to Arthur Ashe? Uh, yes, but uh, I really don't want to do that. Uh, sometimes you wish you could, but on second thought, it's not too good because uh, you don't want to look back. Uh, I always look forward to the rest of today and tomorrow. Uh, what's in the past is past, and there's water under the dam, and you learn from your mistakes, and you must go from there.